Hello, I'm Claire. Um, this is my home. Um, I'm sure you all know exactly where that is. That's the beautiful West Pier in Brighton. I'm a Brightonian. I was born in Brighton. And I still live in Brighton. Yeah, as a few of us still actually do exist. Um, and this was my playground when I was growing up. Um, we did have other playgrounds in Brighton. We're not that backwards. But, we, but I, would, I love the seafront. That's where I grew up. That's where I um, spent most of my time when I was a child. Uh, doing beach combing and picking up mermaids' purses and, and trying to catch blennies in the rock pools. Uh, the seafront was where I felt the most alive. And I actually adored the seafront. Uh, and I wanted to be a marine biologist. That's the only thing I wanted to do. Um, uh, which is what I didn't do because I ended up going to University of Brighton and studied interior architecture. Um, <laughs> back when um, I wanted to be a marine biologist, the only place you could work in Brighton because going anywhere else was completely inconceivable as a child. You didn't think about travelling for work. I mean, how bonkers. Um, you could, I could only have worked at the Sea Life Centre. Back then it was the Brighton um, Dolphin Area. I'm sure some of you, ooh, some of you might remember that. Um, with the two dolphins that uh, were set free, Missy and Silver, and then promptly disappeared. Um, so that was quite a depressing way to work as a marine biologist. Uh, apologies to any marine biologists who might see this uh, that did work there. So, but, but I didn't want to do that, so I ended up doing interior architecture um, at University of Brighton. And this is a sort, of a, a sort of a spectrum of the things that I do now. I wear many, many different hats. Um, so the first thing I do in my day job, I actually run a, um, a circular economy design and interior architecture studio in the city, um, imaginatively named after me. Um, I also teach at the University of Sussex. I teach the product designers how to become uh, better designers and forward-thinking designers and sustainable designers. I also um, work with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative uh, as a volunteer. Now, this is a term that most of you probably will not know. A lot of people don't know the term ghost gear. But basically, it's given to uh, abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded fishing gear. Uh, the acronym we know is ALDEFUG. Really nice and plunky. <laughs> Um, and it's basically abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear. So it's anything that's fishing related that ends up in the ocean that carries on fishing after it's lost, hence the ghost terminology. So nets and things like that, the things get entangled in. And the Global Ghost Initiative is um, uh, um, a global co organisation of anything from NGOs through to governments, um, all the way through to grassroots activists that are working together to create and mitigate the issues of that. Uh, I'm also a regional rep for Surfers Against Sewage. Um, some of you might know SAS. It's a UK-wide marine-based charity. It started off with surfers protesting about the sewage. <coughs> First came to Brighton in 1991. Um, now we don't talk so much about sewage, uh, and I'm not a surfer, so I don't tick two of those boxes. I'm a snowboarder that talks about plastic. Um, and then finally, up there is, oh, just about to see on the, the right-hand side, it is a campaign that my studio set up, uh, which was going to be a small campaign um, called Plastic Free Pledge that we were just going to do in the city and now it's grown into something quite crackers and international which is amazing. We do that uh, for fun and the corporate jobs we do sort of pay for the sort of activism stuff and campaigning we do around that and that's all about trying to encourage people to stop using so much single-use plastic as individuals. Um, so there's one thing that knits all this stuff together. Um, I'm going to be talking about plastic. I talk about plastic a lot but this is the one thing I want you to take home um, today. Um, plastic isn't bad. It's actually really freaking great, and that's sort of the problem. You hear a lot of conversations in the news at the moment about how plastic is awful, plastic is the enemy. Uh, it isn't. We couldn't live our lives without plastic. I mean, how many of us want to go into hospital and have a... Uh, well, you can have the brand new um, uh, IV tube, or you can have the one that we think we've cleaned all right, but we're not too sure. I think all of us would plump for the one that's, that's clean and nice and sterile, thanks. That's a really, really good use of plastic. Whereas the um, forks that you might get with your salads from pret a manger your Marks and Spencers or Sainsbury's that you'll use for about 10 minutes, that's a really poor use of the material. So we need to really readjust how we think about the material itself. Uh, and the problem is, it's a really freaky, scary problem. As you all know, if you turn on the news, anything from Sky all the way down to our local news, we're talking about plastic. Um, so I'm going to run through a few of the really scary things about the material, just in case you've missed those. Um, so, a few facts for you. About 8 million tonnes of plastic enter our global oceans um, every single year, which is the equivalent approximately to one garbage truck globally per minute. That's a lot. Uh, this is globally, obviously, uh, but we are one, we are united um, in the world by, by two things, uh, by the air and by the sea. So when we say oceans, 
we actually mean ocean. There is one ocean. So whatever happens, one part of the world connects through to us. So every small action really does add up. And you might know about gyres. You might hear people talking about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which uh, is number one on here. Now, a gyre is an interconnecting convergent current, uh, or two convergent currents, that basically smash together and create like a vortex, which is huge. And these become the collection points for plastic in the oceans. So the first one was discovered, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, in the 90s, by Captain Charles Moore, who I met at a very dweeby conference last year. And honestly, I was fangirling. I, I went, oh! and took a photo. I was like, I'm so excited. Um, so I oh, know, it, really, it was like, nice to meet you. Oh, God, let me take a photo. Uh, lovely man, he was lovely. Um, but we know that there's five gyres across the, the world, maybe six, and these are collection points that we have for plastic. So when you hear people about going clearing up the continent of plastic, you might have heard, or there's a whole um, uh, equivalent to three times the size of France. These are the things that people are talking about, these are the gyres. Um, and people say, well, if you know what it is, just go and hoover it up. It, you can't because a lot of it actually looks like this. It's like a plastic soup. Um, and plastic is, it doesn't biodegrade, but it does degrade in the sense that the sun and the waves um, and the temperature gradually breaks it down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and it ends up being microplastics, as, well, as we now know, which is very, very small fragments. Some of it floats, some of it sinks, but a lot of it sort of cascades down through the water column. So you can't just go and hoover it up. And unfortunately, a lot of it is the same size as things like plankton. And you think about plankton as at the base of our food chain in the oceans. Everything that is big starts off eating things that are smaller than it. And the very small things eat the tiny things. So if we're hoovering up all the plastic, we're hoovering up all the tiny um, life, effectively, which means that we're disrupting the food chain. So it's very, very complicated. You can't just hoover it up, unfortunately. So who has eaten mussels in the last year? few people. Um, if you've eaten mussels, um, I can categorically guarantee you that you've eaten microplastics. Because 100% of mussels that were surveyed across the south coast um, a couple of years ago, but then in UK waters, both farmed and wild, um, all contained microplastics in 2018. And that's because um, the way mussels feed themselves, they're filter feeders. So they're, they're, they're filtering in all of that little, all of the sea, um, sea water and passing it through and then they're actually ingesting the microplastics themselves. Um, that's a bit of a scary fact. I actually became vegetarian again at the beginning of 2017. And one of my friends said to me, oh, is it because of what the stuff you do with, with plastics? And I was, yeah, that's part of the reason for why I'm now vegetarian again. Um, so there we go, so that's another scary fact. Uh, the other scary fact, another scary, there's lots of scary facts to do with, don't worry, it does get better. Um, plastic lasts for an incredibly long time. We're yet to outlive any piece of plastic we've ever created as a species. Uh, maybe 500 years, maybe 600 years, we don't actually know. And because it lasts such a long time, it's floating around, it's kicking around, uh, it ends up becoming like a little toxic bomb. So we don't know exactly what goes into making a lot of plastics because it's recipes that the manufacturers invent themselves for different properties, but because it's lasting for such a long time, all the other free-floating chemicals, which are hydrophobic, so they don't like kicking around in the open ocean, they tend to stick to whatever's there the longest. Of course, plastic lasts a long time, so lots of stuff sticks to it. And hydrophobic chemicals is a little bit like when you create, um, when you do a lasagna or a spaghetti bolognese, and you get that red sort of film that sticks to your washing up bowl. So you've done your washing up, and then you look down and you go, oh man, it's still there. That's because all the oils are hydrophobic. They don't like being in the washing up water. They want to stick to the plastic. They want to stick to the edges. So whenever you're taking this home, because I'm sure you're going to take all of this information home, you can explain using lasagna what the hydrophobic chemicals on plastic. And one of the big facts that was put, um, put out a couple of years ago by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who are researchers in the circular economy, was that if we carry on in this way, um, there will be more plastic than fish by weight in our oceans by 2050, which isn't really that long away. Um, this is often misquoted, and people say there'd be more plastic than fish, which is actually quite wrong, because if we think about the quantity of fish versus the weight of the fish, this is the largest fish we have in our oceans, this is a whale shark. So one adult whale shark can weigh 19,000 kilograms, which is the equivalent of 150,000 empty one-litre pet plastic bottles. 
If we say one fish, one bottle, one fish, one piece of plastic, it doesn't quite add up. So actually, the weight makes it even more depressing. This is all really rather depressing. I'm looking at you all now and you're going, oh man, I came out on a Thursday night for this. And she's the last one as well. There is some good stuff going on. And this is where the end of the talk is. So you can actually go out and think these are positive things because it can get incredibly depressing. Um, so how do we make a positive out of effectively what is a huge problem and a global problem? Of course, you've got organisations like SAS. SAS, um, the Marine Conservation Society, Sea Shepherd. There's loads of people who are doing beach cleans and working literally on all the way around the coast to try and stop things from getting in the ocean itself. Everybody can go to a beach clean. You can go to Google, go to Facebook. There will be one. You turn up, you get given... Um, uh, a litter picker, you get given a bit of health and safety training and you can do five minutes or you can do an hour. It really makes no difference because every single thing makes a huge difference. So there's lots of people doing good stuff. And we're really active in Brighton at home, so if you want to come along our way, we've got all sorts of cool stuff that kicks around. Um, the way we talk about it when we talk about plastic is that if you were had a bathroom, so say your, your bath was overflowing and you go in, it's like, oh man, there's water going everywhere. Would you first of all start bailing out with a teaspoon? Or would you turn the tap off? <laughs> You'd probably turn the tap off and then go and get your teaspoon, or at least a ladle. So when we talk about plastics and do our beach cleans, we feel like sometimes we're the teaspoon. We're, like, we're continually trying hard and hard, and all the volunteers that come with us and give up their time in wind and rain, um, we feel like we're the teaspoon sometimes, and we feel like we're sometimes banging our head against the brick wall when it comes to actually turning off that tap. But that's changing a lot. Um, many more people are aware and are actually helping us to turn off that tap. And this is where Plastic Free Pledge, the campaign that we set up in the studio, was going to be. Um, it was going to sit because we wanted to say, OK, Brighton and Hove, all along the seafront area, let's just stop using plastic straws. Now, this was back in 2016 where people didn't even think about a plastic straw. Um, they just used them indiscriminately. And we thought we could do something on the seafront because we've got so many bars and restaurants. So we started up the campaign um, because we were like, this is the low-hanging fruit. 99% of us do not need a straw. Some of us do, for health reasons or mobility reasons, but most people don't need a straw. You're given a straw, sometimes you're given two straws because, hey, that looks a little bit sexy because one's straight and one's kinked. Uh, <laughs> you don't actually need it for most of us anyway. And this is a, some more scary stats for you. I promise this was to be the positive bit, but I throw a few scary bits in as well. Um, about 500 million plastic straws um, are made every single day. They're used for about 20 minutes and would last plus, uh, you know, above sort of 600 years. That's not great use of resource if we're talking about anything. You know, these fossil fuels, plastic, this is, is it better that we've actually dug up and we've fracked this material to make something we use for 20 minutes when most of us don't need it? Probably not. So we started the campaign. We said, okay, fine, we're not going to use plastic straws anymore. How many places want to get on board? Um, we've got some flies which were printed on recycled board with vegetable-based inks. Um, and we started going to talk to people and loads of venues started going, yeah, that's a great idea, why are we not doing this already? We we'll, we'll, won't give out straws um, or we'll go to um, paper straws or something similar. Uh, and before we knew it, we had 60 venues in Brighton and Hove. We thought, this is pretty cool, this is going a little bit further than we thought. Uh, and then we ended up writing two motions for full council that was passed with Brighton Hope City Council back in um, November 2017. Uh, and this was committing the council to actually do a huge amount of ac you know, action with regards to single-use plastics and look at what they were doing before they started talking to other people and saying, well, everybody else should do it. They were going to get their own house in order. Um, and we're still working with the council now. Plastic Free Pledge, we run completely philanthropically. We just do that in our spare time. And then it's great to be able to say, OK, we're actually affecting positive change with everybody that's supporting us. Um, and now, we're an international campaign. We, had, we didn't really have a brand, we just sort of had an idea, we got things together, we're, we're designers by trade, and as soon as it started to get bigger, we're thinking, hmm, we'd better make sure we've got a good identity. So we had a really, really talented graphic designer um, from very young studio, creates an identity, uh, and now it's an international campaign, and we have ambassadors all over the world that sort of spread the word of single-use plastic. Um, which is absolutely insane. Um, we've now got 300 plus places signed up, and anybody can go to our website, um, and you can actually look at each of the geographical areas, mostly in the UK, to be fair, but internationally as well. We've just had a sign up from, um, yesterday, from Toronto, and from Auckland, and we've got Myanmar as well, so we've got quite a variety. 
The idea is you can go to the map, and if you want to support a place that's actually doing a good thing and really reducing their single-use plastics, you can go and find them on our map. We go and stick the maps on there, or Google Maps, so you can use that as a resource. The pledge, we call them. And it's not just independence, it's big boys as well. Um, I'm really bad on social media, because I will... We had Jamie's uh, Italian sign up really early, and then I was just on social media going, uh, hey, we're hacker. Jamie's have done it. Why aren't you doing it? <laughs> uh, and then um, sometimes they ignored me. And then sometimes, like uh, the guy from Leon, uh, messaged me immediately. He was like, um, can we please have a telephone conversation? I was like, I've got myself in trouble now. Uh, and then within minutes, I'm talking to the sustainability manager. And she's like, great, what do we need to do? Uh, I was like, oh, um, just return this form and say what you're going to do. Sometimes it's really easy. You just need to ask people the right questions. So we've got some great people that have signed up. And it's literally growing every single day. So to sort of finish up, here's a few bits of positive news with regards to plastic that you might have missed, you might have seen. Um, there's some good stuff going on. So many retailers will now give you money off your hot drink if you use a reusable cup. I uh, was talking actually earlier on, weight trays have actually stopped giving you um, disposable cups. So if you don't take a reusable cup, you don't get your free cup of coffee. Um, and this actually means that a lot of people now are thinking, oh, sort of offsetting the cost of a reusable cup against how much money you might save. pret manger will give you 50p every set currently, um, every single time you use your reusable cup. So it doesn't take long before you're actually saving money in a sense. You're still spending money because you're still buying coffee from somebody else. Um, we actually have a ban on microplastics in the beauty and cosmetics products in the UK. Did you know? No. no. Um, there's a brilliant app that you can use. Uh, some brands are still in transition. Um, we're still at sort of the cusp of transition. And you can actually, if you're really geeky like me, you can download an app which will, you can scan the barcodes for products and it will tell you whether it's got any microplastics hidden. Because quite often, you know, retailers are sneaky and they call it, they don't say, this contains plastic, because nobody would buy it. So they sort of hide it in the ingredients list. But now we have got a ban. Um, the key thing about this is it covers the cosmetics industry. So face scrubs and toothpastes, anything that would need to abrade is where plastics used to be. Uh, but it doesn't cover things like drain cleaners. Um, and like scrubs for maybe mechanics and things like that. So anything else that's abrasive that maybe would come under maybe an industrial cleaning product. So if you think about it, if you're a, a fish or a mussel, do you really care whether it's something that's come out of a face scrub or if it's something that's come out of a drain cleaner? No, you're going to eat it anyway. So we still need to work a little bit harder, but we're working in the right way. Many retailers have now switched the stick. This was a campaign that started down in Bristol. So now you don't get when you get your cotton buds. I remember cotton buds when they were paper before. And then they became plastic because plastic was cheaper to produce. Um, and now many places are going back to paper. So a huge amount of retailers have now got cotton buds that have got paper sticks rather than plastic ones. You shouldn't be flushing them down the loo anyway. We see so many of them on beach cleans, it's absolutely crackers. Um, the UK government is currently consulting on a deposit return scheme. Um, now, I'm not going to make sweeping statements about the audience, but I know my dad um, remembers the deposit return schemes of, of the past. Does anybody remember those at all? Yeah. Pot bottles, yeah. milk bottles. Yeah. You know, when you had a milk person, they kind of delivered your milk. I mean, that's now coming back into it. But back then, we valued materials, and manufacturers understood that they had a glass bottle that they could use 20, 30, maybe more times. So why would they be cost, you know, spending out to make another one? Plastic has replaced a lot of materials because it's cheap and throwaway. When now we're realising that materials shouldn't be cheap and throwaway, we should be valuing them more. So deposit return schemes are a way of capturing that material back and you'll get, like you do on the continent, if everybody's seen the same sort of schemes, you get 20p back every time you put a plastic bottle into a machine that gives you a voucher and then you can go and spend it or something, or give it to charity. We still don't know exactly how it's going to work, but that is coming to the UK. Scotland is already getting it. They're way ahead of us, Scotland, um, as is a lot of the continent on this. So keep your eyes open for this. Iceland has committed to being completely plastic-free across its entire range by 2023. Now, that's pretty staggering. I know Iceland aren't the huge um, retailers of like the Sainsbury's and the Tesco's, but Richard Walker, who's the CEO, has committed. He's an um, actual um, service against, he's a surfer himself, and a service against sewage. Uh, he's an incredible supporter. He said, we could do this, I'm sure we could do this. And 2023 isn't that long when you think about supply chains. But they can do it, so why can't other retailers? So this is where we need to vote with our wallets. If you see something, if you want to support people, support the people that are doing the great thing. Waitrose is going to be removing all plastic bags from their fruit and veg departments uh, this spring. 
don't know exactly when it's coming, so it's going to be replaced with paper bags or something similar. Interesting point about plastic bags uh, versus paper bags. If you look at the carbon footprint, quite often the actual paper bags have a higher carbon footprint than the plastic does. But of course the plastic is going to be a huge issue long-lasting, whereas the paper bags um, can be composted or recycled, depending on what you've got your local authority. So this has come from consumer drive. People say, we don't want plastic bags anymore, so retailers are listening. We really do have a voice. And Morrisons are going to be trialling paper bags as well. They're going to be putting up the price of their bags for life because back when the 5p charge came in for our plastic bags, that was like, I'm not going to pay 5p. Mm -hmm. I'm going to carry all my groceries out of my arse, thank you very much. And I've seen people do that. And then, you know, our 5p, our oh, sorry, 5p. And then we had a huge decrease in plastic bag use. And then it gradually started to creep back up again because people got used to that. Well, it's only 5p. So this is why a lot of retailers are either removing them or actually pushing the price up. So, I mean, I think plastic bags should be a quid. Because if they're a quid, that's a lot of money, a quid. 5p is like penny, literally pennies. If it was a pound, you really would think twice about not taking your reusable bag. Uh, but that's because I'm a deep greenie and I have enough bags for life to last about a thousand years. So, uh, <laughs> there you go. So, and the great positive thing is, obviously, you guys are all here. And you've listened to me bleat on about plastics for the last 15, probably plus minutes, because I do tend to waffle. Um, so, you know, that's a real positive thing. Um, take one thing from this and mention it to somebody, and that's how good things spread through conversation and through sparks. So thank you very much for being here with me. Um, and if you want to say hi, you're on the socials and want to, or want to email me, please do. I love talking about anything to do with plastic. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, question straight away. Yeah, um, given that you obviously think that the knowledge you is here is, is formed, therefore we're older, where do you think it all went wrong? <laughs> oh, where did it all go wrong? There are many ways it went wrong. Um, it went wrong from a material perspective because plastic, be we, we realised that plastic could be produced so quickly, so cheaply, and it was a lighter weight. So a lot of places thought, well, why are we... Because if you're transporting stuff, so say um, fizzy drinks, if you're transporting fizzy drinks, there's obviously a cost that goes in transporting fizzy drinks, and obviously there's a weight that goes in transporting things around. If you think about the milk person um, or transportation, if you drop a, a plastic bottle, it probably won't break, whereas if you dropped a glass bottle, it probably would break. So there was a, a, a tipping point where the benefits of one material started to outweigh the others. When, when that was when when oh um oh in, in exactly when scales. it was the 70s the 70s yeah yes when we between had, the, yeah this, when we still had deposit bottles so. yeah so between the 60s and the 70s was when plastic started to have this big boom of it not being a niche material an expensive material but it becoming an accessible material and there's some really now we look back and there's some quite horrific adverts of going you don't need to wash up anymore because you can throw it away and literally you sit there going, ah! but that was the mentality is that, you know, this material is going to change our lives. You didn't have to do so much with the other materials anymore because it was cheap and it was throwaway. We didn't understand that. So that was really, the, the boom was the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm trying to kind of, the point that I'm just interested in is, I think it's great that, you know, you, you say like, you know, the, the big players, you know, Starbucks are, Costas, or, I mean, I would say that I've never been to a Starbucks or a Costa because I would never ever buy anything. Well, I never would drink out of a plastic straw. I would just never do that. Mm. Um, isn't it these um, companies, these people that for a generation that have come in, McDonald's or the burgers and everything, which is not my generation, I wouldn't go and buy a burger, yeah. but younger people would, a certain generation would. Oh, it is. is it not that generation that have introduced the necessity for plastic. Yeah, it's and, and it's that generation which the slightly older people of that generation are now kind of thinking, oops, oh, for sure. shouldn't be doing that now. I'm not, now we want paper. For sure. Uh, I mean, my, my dad turned 73, I'm sure you won't mind me saying that, um, very recently. Um, he thinks it's bonkers. We went out Christmas shopping um, and I was like, oh, let's go for a coffee. Why are we going for a coffee? Why we spend, how much is that coffee? And literally I was like, is it, oh, we went to a local coffee house in, in Brighton. It was really lovely coffee and it was freezing cold. But he was like, why, why are we going for coffee? We can go home and have a coffee. Because to him it was like, 
Why are you spending your money on doing that? And I think it is, it's the gener I definitely agree that it's the generations that took on the convenience of, you know, not making your lunch at home, but going out and buying it. And of course, then if you're buying your lunch out, there's more retailers that are going to give you more and more and more and more choice to try and get your money. But I would, um, I would argue that it's the sorry, I know it's hmm? but I would argue that it's the, the retailers themselves that actually brought this about. Oh, it is, yeah. And I would say that it's not the, the buying of the plastic bag in the supermarket in 5p, it's the fact that you can't buy any vegetables in a supermarket that's in plastic. Yeah. And that's been the case for years. Yeah, it's because what, the... What's been addressed about that? Um, the, re the, the supermarkets will say it's because people won't buy loose vegetables. Exactly, it's a, it's yeah. a generational thing. Yeah, because um, people don't like ugly veg was one thing that they said and then there was a trial and people were like, well, carrots are carrot, I don't care. Um, some of it is the fact that, you know, straight carrots are easy to peel, whereas ones that are a little bit quirky and have a little bit, so people go, oh no, that's related to food waste. So there's, there's loads of arguments and counter arguments, but a lot of it comes down to the supermarkets, in particular, in this case, saying that people won't buy, people won't spend the time to take, you know, to pick five apples because they just want to grab a bag and go. But the trouble is, even with the loose apples, for example, you're putting them in a plastic bag anyway. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's a few people, including my mum, bless her, who will go to the till with like this like whole bundle of loose vegetables and fruits, um, and then they will weigh them and she'll put them straight into her bag. But the way the system is set up doesn't help us as individuals at all. Um, but the supermarkets will invariably turn around and say, well, that's because you've told us that that's what you want. I would challenge that. Yeah. Any, any, any final questions? Because I, yeah, comes to the time. Yeah. You, you said interestingly about remembering um, cotton buds when they were paper the first time, yeah. as I do, and I also remember when the supermarkets all used uh, paper yeah. for their carrier bags, could mm. food cost less at Sainsbury's, etc. No, do you know what, I don't, um, I, I remember, well, we I mean, anyway. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and I think this, this is the, I talk a lot about um, the plastic bag versus paper bag issue, uh, and it is incredibly complex, because if we were to switch over to all paper bags, how much extra Paper, will we need, and where does that paper come from? It comes from trees. So unless it's recycled paper, unless it's a particular way of, of using the resource, we could end up creating another problem. And a great quick example of that is when, um, uh, so who owns a fleece, like a fleece jumper? Most people, I would say, own a fleece or have a fleece. When fleeces were first created, we were like, is this amazing? We could take a PET plastic bottle, we could reprocess it, and we can make this amazing jumper, we can make a fleece. We go, that's great, that's a great use of material, it's great use of recycling. Uh, and now we know that every single time you wash that, there's uh, 15 to 20,000 microfibers get washed straight out of your washing machine, straight into the ocean, because we don't have the capacity to catch them. So they're so small, they wash straight into the seas. This is, you know, it's globally. How many fleeces are being washed every single day? So we solve one problem and just create another one. And my, I sort of sit on the fence with the paper bag thing, because it's like, everyone's going, bring us paper bags! And it's like, oh, just take a reusable bag. You know, just take, get smaller produce bags if you can. Use that rather than, you know, demanding a paper bag instead, because I think that might be the fleece of the next five years. There we are. Um, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna stop it there because we're 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 running we're running late. Uh, and I could talk for a long time. <laughs> can we can we thank Claire for a fabulous. <laughs>